Good morning. Welcome to the Institute for Security Studies View on Africa. This week we're going to be looking at uh, developments in the Democratic Republic of Congo. My name is Stephanie Walters and I'm the head of the Peace and Security Research Program at the ISS here in Pretoria. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I wanted to um, today take a look at the, take a snapshot actually of what's happened in the last two months and discuss um, some of the options that we might um, want to look at as we move forward in 2018 um, towards the electoral date that we were given at the end of 2017 by the uh, Congolese government and see whether that is realistic technically um, and also whether we think that the environment in which those elections might actually take place is an environment that's conducive to uh, free and fair and credible elections being held. So I want to start with um, um, some perspectives on a changing uh, approach that the Congolese opposition, political and civil society, has taken over the last two months. As we know, at the beginning of, um, or at the end of 2016, there was the conclusion of a political accord between the Congolese opposition and the Congolese government, which was meant to map out progress towards elections that were due to be held at the end of 2017. Over the course of 2017, we had a number of different events that ultimately, through that calendar and also that process and the structures that were to oversee that process into disarray. And we ended 2017 essentially with the Congolese opposition, political opposition, once again at odds with the Congolese government over a, a variety of issues, including the election date and the mandate for President Kabila. Um, towards the end of last year, um, the Congolese um, Catholic Church started to play again an increasingly political role. It had remained neutral in 2016 when it had uh, mediated the talks that led to the December 31st agreement. Over the course of 2017, it increasingly became active as a, a player pushing for credible elections to be held as soon as possible. Um, it has now essentially taken, if you will, the lead on organizing um, opposition and criticism of the Congolese government and its management of the electoral environment. There is something called the Comité Laïque, uh, which is um, essentially meant to be the, the, the non-religious uh, committee of the Catholic Church, but which is nonetheless driven by the Catholic Church. And they have been the primary organizers of the last two big protests we've seen in DRC. The first one uh, of that nature was on December 31st, and the second one was a few weeks ago in January 21st. Now, the December 31st um, protest were essentially meant to indicate the um, unhappiness with the, uh, the failure to implement the December 31st, 2016 accords and hold elections by the end of 2017, and were meant to at the same time emphasize that that accord, that December 31st, 2016 accord, is the proper roadmap for how the country can move towards elections. Um, so those were the, the two key points that the, the protests at the end of 2017 were pushing. Now, the Congolese government has put a blanket ban on political marches and, again, also did not authorize the um, protests or the march of December 31st, 2017. Um, what we then saw, it was a Sunday, people were going to church. It's a day where traditionally people go to church anyway because it's the end of the year. We saw um, uh, people marching in the streets peacefully. It was an apolitical event. Political parties participated but were specifically asked not to bring party insignia. Um, and it was essentially a peaceful march through the streets of Kinshasa, but also people um, just praying in church um, for peace and stability for the country. Now, the crackdown that we saw in, in response to this by the government was the same type of crackdown we've seen again and again uh, over the course of 2015, 2016, and 2017. Um, we had um, tear gas being thrown into churches. We had uh, Catholic church staff being arrested, um, people who were praying being arrested. We had civil society be arrested and so on. And we had a casualty figure of six dead on December 3rd. The uh, January 21st march again was led by the Catholic Church, the Comité Laïque. Uh, it followed much uh, the same um, model and we again had exactly the same response from the government, uh, refusing to allow the march to take place and then a severe crackdown on those who participated in it. Um, again, uh, we had in, in, in the January 21st march, we had seven killed. That's the official uh, tally that we have from civil society and also from the United Nations. This tally is, uh, uh, casualty figure is contested by the government. 
Um, the government's response has been utterly defiant. Not only has it uh, chosen to, um, to, to essentially uh, deploy the security services into the streets and to allow them to shoot live ammunition at people participating in these marches, but also the, the official statements coming from people like the Minister of Communications have been um, extremely um, um, uncooperative. And it, it, we have seen um, the um, justification for the crackdown on marches along the lines of these are terrorists we know that the the, the 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 people who intend to go on the political marches are in fact terrorists and not political activists and this kind of very hyped up propaganda from the Congolese government in response to these um, uh, recurrent uh, peaceful marches organized by the Catholic Church um, there's also been, as I said, a refutation of the casualty figures um, and, um, and of the arrest figures and of the um, information about the number of people who have been disappeared. Um, after the January 21st, or in the aftermath of the January 21st protests, we've seen also Catholic Church staff being picked up since then and arrested, uh, detained, often without any kind of information about where they are. And that is also something we've seen with human rights activists and journalists alike. Um, at the end of 20, at the end of the of January, uh, Joseph Kabila gave uh, a rare press conference. He hadn't held a press conference in about five years, um, and these are often, uh, and of course, when you only hold a press conference every five years, they are widely listened to. But I think that they're particularly closely watched because there are two key questions that everybody wants Joseph Kabila to answer, and which are a key determinant of whether or not there will be stability, uh, or increased stability, or increased instability in the DRC in the, in the coming months. Um, the first question, again, and it's always been the question that has been put to him, is will he stand for another term? Now, we have again and again repeated that the Constitution won't allow him to stand for another term. He's limited to two mandates. His second mandate expired at the end of 2016. This is a clause of the Constitution that cannot be amended except by referendum. Um, and. Um, he refused again to answer that. Uh, he, he, his response to that was, I refer you to the Constitution. Now, this evasiveness uh, is something that again and again has frustrated uh, observers, domestic and international alike. And it, it, it leads people to, to, to question whether there can be any certainty to the kind of, to respect for the Constitution and the holding of elections at the end of this year. The second question was indeed about a referendum. Um, does, the, does the Congolese government intend to use this period between now and elections to try and push through a referendum um, uh, on changing the Constitution? Again, this was a question that Kabila avoided. So those are two elements where I would say he had the opportunity to provide stabilizing messages and he chose not to. He did speak about the fa uh, about a new law on public um, uh, on, on public political participation, political gatherings, and political marches, which will be ma uh, submitted to Parliament during the March session. Um, of course, we have to remember that the um, MP, the ruling party, has a majority in Parliament. Uh, so we'll have to see what exactly that law entails. Um, on questions about um, opening up the political space, which is a key element of the December 31st, 2016 accord, Kabila was also relatively vague. We know there are a number of political prisoners who remain imprisoned. There is, of course, the ban on public uh, political marches. And then there are also uh, pending legal cases or legal judgments against some of the key political op opponents, notably Moise Katumbi. So no real progress on trying to really uh, create a, 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 a level playing field on the on, on the political front. Kabila also raised an interesting question, um, and it's an indication of, of where the government may choose to go, asking, is it more important that we have development and that we dedicate our national, our limited budget and our limited national revenue to development, or is it more important that we dedicate uh, our, our, our finances to elections. Now, this question leads us to question whether or not the government will, in fact, um, release the funds that it, we, the country needs in order to hold those elections on time, and to what extent it will expect that the international community pick up a significant part of the tab. We know that the Congolese government cannot pay the full bill. It's $1.2 billion, according to the CINI. Um, but we, um, we don't know, even if it will 
provide part of the financing, how much of that it will provide, and if it will do so in a timely manner. So again, the issue of raising development versus elections, what do we need more? Uh, what will stabilize our country more when, when Kabila raises that, it raises questions about the commitment to, to, the, to the elections being held. He also reiterated that the December 31st Accord has been implemented in letter and in spirit, which is of course a key sticking point between him and the Congolese opposition, which feels that he hijacked that process and staffed the key structures that are meant to um, um, oversee this transition with uh, political opponents who he has co-opted. So that was essentially the message from Kabila, an opportunity, in my view, uh, in which he again demonstrated his unwillingness to take some of the key steps that have to be taken to stabilize the, the political mood and to actually lend credibility to the processes led by the government. Um, now, finally, the last element of this, and then I'll ask some questions and then open up for, for your questions and comments, is just some technical information. The Independent Electoral Commission has completed the voter registration process in January. There are now 46 million voters who are enrolled. This is an essential element of the, of the preparations for the elections. It's one of the key technical reasons the government has always put forward as a, as a, as a driver of these delays that are now in their second year. Uh, so that has been completed. Um, on the other hand, we have a very um, an ongoing dispute essentially between the CINI and the group of experts which the United Nations General Assembly had decided to put in place. Now, let, let me just review that. That was in September last year on the sidelines of the, of the UN General Assembly. There was a decision by the United Nations, the African Union, the organization of the Francophonie and SADC to put together a technical committee that would accompany and work alongside of the Congolese Independent Electoral Commission and that would act both as an insight for donors and for other interested parties including Congolese civil society and the opposition, into progress made at CINI. It was, it was meant to increase transparency and accountability and visibility of the CINI's actions. And of course, also to assist the CINI in, in some of the, the difficult uh, processes that it needed to take. Um, now, the Congolese government had initially accepted the composition of this group of experts. Um, subsequently, we've seen uh, um, some of the key people um, involved in that group travel to Kinshasa. Some of them are already there, but there is an ongoing dispute about their mandate, with the group of experts indicating that they uh, are independent, that they should be allowed to express independently their views on how the process is going, and that they should not have to submit any kinds of statements that they want to make publicly to the uh, CENI for approval or to the Congolese government for approval beforehand. There is also contestation around the fact that this group um, uh, has been put under a presidential committee. So in other words, it's, there's an attempt by the presidency to try and limit uh, its interaction with the CENI and also the extent to which it can speak publicly. Um, so this is an ongoing issue. It means that the group is not functional. Um, and I think it is an insight again into um, how serious the CNE is about trying to establish its own credibility in order to deliver elections that then have credibility and legitimacy with the Congolese electorate and other uh, interested parties. Um, I should also add at the very end there that SADC was the only uh, organ of these four organizations that had not yet nominated a member to a person to be on this group. Uh, that is something that SADC uh, says it will do imminently. We saw the um, Secretary General of SADC meeting uh, in Kinshasa last week also with the European Union, um, who's also involved in that committee, um, and saying that they support um, the Congolese electoral process. We'll see whether or not this leads to an imminent nomination and whether whether SADC is able to push the CNE in any significant way towards accepting uh, this independent group of experts. I just want to end with a few questions. Um, there are many other things we can touch on probably in, in the course of our question and answer period. But I think that, that fundamentally we have to look at what we have in front of us. We have now an electoral date. Uh, again, it's the 23rd of December 2018. We have the completion of the voter registration process. But on the other hand, we have a political space that is closed. 
where um, political opponents are not allowed to speak freely and fairly, where we have civil society groupings that are not allowed to express themselves freely and fairly, where we have a president who speaks critically against the Catholic Church and against other, um, 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 uh, other critics. Um, and we, we really don't have the kind of a political environment in February 2018 that can deliver a credible election. Um, we, I think it's time for the international community to think very hard about whether or not it wants to support an electoral process under these circumstances, and if so, at what cost. We, of course, have seen uh, very critical statements coming from the United States and France and Belgium, um, other key players, the EU, but also the African Union on the events, on the human rights violations we've seen around the political marches. But I think we need to go further. Um, I think that it is really, it would be um, an, a very positive step if we could see um, perhaps some kind of renewed mediation, possibly led by the African Union, um, with a very credible and neutral facilitator to try and get the key parties around the table and revitalize these institutions like the follow-up committee to the December 31st, 2016 Accords to really um, create that structure of legitimacy and credibility that those accords had originally lent to the transition that was due to take place in 2017. I think without that, we are, we are heading into a more and more acute political crisis, a very polarized political environment, um, and increasing clashes between civil society, political opposition, and the security forces in the DRC. And I think that in, in, in terms of these options that we might want to look at, I think it's very important that we have the African Union speaking very plainly and clearly, and also SADC taking an important role in, in, in speaking out about the need for credible and transparent elections in the DRC.